why should we study the brain? First, most obvious reason, know thyself. Know what this thing is that's operating in our heads. This is who you are, right, is your brain. There are lots of very fine and important organs in the body, but the brain is special, right? So, you know, a heart is important, you'd die without it, but it's the brain that's your identity, right? So there's a reason that surgeons do heart transplants. That makes sense. Something wrong with your heart, you need another heart, okay? But why don't they do brain transplants? That wouldn't make sense, right? If there's something wrong with my brain, it doesn't make sense to take someone else's brain and put it in here because then I'd be that other person. It doesn't make sense because the brain is who you are. Okay, so the brain is really special. It's not just another organ. Uh, that's why a few years ago we had the decade of the brain, right? Not the decade of the pancreas or the liver or the kidney, right? People need to study these things. They know how to fix them. They need to know how to fix them. They're important, but they're not as cosmic as the brain. Okay, second reason why we should understand brains, and that is to understand the limits of human knowledge. Like the more we understand about the human mind, the more we can like actually evaluate how good our knowledge is. Are there things that we might not be able to think? Possible true scientific theories we might not be able to understand ever? You can think of studying the mind as a kind of empirical epistemology, a way to actually know about the knower so we can figure out how good the knowledge is in that knower. Right? So that's another reason. A third reason is to advance AI. And so up until a few years ago, I used to give lectures on vision and they would all start with some version of this. You guys all have amazing visual abilities in the back third of your brain that does vision. You can do all this incredible stuff that no machine can touch. Hats off to you. You have an amazing visual system back here. And those guys in AI, it is mostly guys, guys, gals, whatever, those people in AI, um, could only dream of coming up with algorithms as good as the one that's running in the back of your head. You can't quite start the lectures that way anymore. So if any of you have been living in a cave and not heard about deep nets, there's been a massive revolution. And all of a sudden, deep nets are doing things that are really close to human abilities, particularly in vision. So for example, in visual object recognition, Machines were way far behind human vision until very recently, especially when this paper here came out, was published in 2012, first author Krzyzewski. It has now been cited an astonishing 33,000 times. Actually, I made this slide a couple weeks ago. It's probably been cited 36,000 times by now. You could look it up on Google Scholar and find out. That is a huge number of citations. The influence of this paper is ginormous. Probably half of you have already heard about this paper. Raise your hand if you've heard about this paper. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> right, major big news. Okay, um, so what's so important about this paper? They, t they trained, as probably most of you know, they trained a deep net on the over a million images in ImageNet, a massive computer database of images, and they basically taught it to do object recognition. And it performs much more accurately than any previous system, and it approaches human abilities. Okay, so this is major, this is a radical change in the situation that we were in five years ago. So things have changed radically. So just as an example, here's some of the, um, one of the figures from that um, seminal paper. So here is one of the images from ImageNet that, um, that AlexNet, this trained network, was tested on. And the correct answer according to ImageNet is that that's a mite. Uh, and here's what AlexNet says, its number one first answer is might. And its second, third, fourth answers are black widow, cockroach, et cetera, right? So pretty damn good. The might is even sticking off the edge of the frame and it gets it. Container ship, first choice container ship, pretty good. Second choice makes sense, lifeboat, not bad. Look at that, motor scooter. I can barely even see the motor scooter in there, but AlexNet, awesome, right? Leopard, awesome, okay? Even when AlexNet makes a mistake, the mistake is totally understandable. Like, according to ImageNet, that is a picture of a grill, and AlexNet calls it a convertible. I'm siding with AlexNet on this one over ImageNet. Um, this, uh, the correct uh, answer is mushroom, and AlexNet says agaric. I had to look that up. It's like a, a particular kind of mushroom. Um, this one's pretty funny. Um, ImageNet says that's pictures of cherry, 
there's cherries in the foreground. But AlexNet says Dalmatian. I'm siding with AlexNet on this. Um, and, you know, Madagascar cat, et cetera. So pretty amazing. And like nothing even close to this was possible before 2012. So this is very recent history and it has totally shaken up the field in lots of ways. Um, and so that's been transformative, not just for computer science, but it's also been transformative for cognitive science and neuroscience. Because now we have algorithms, like here's this deep net and it does this thing. So that's a possible theory of how humans do it. It's a possible computationally precise theory of what's going on in here. And we didn't used to have those, and now we have those for a number of domains, and that's shaking up the field. There will be a whole lecture on deep nets and how you can use them to think about minds and brains toward the end of the course, guest lecture by my postdoc, Katharina Dobbs, and we'll hear more about that. But let's first step back a second and say, OK, do they really perform as well as humans, even on just object recognition? Well. What if we tested it on images not in ImageNet? Like ImageNet is a pretty good test because these things, as you can see, are highly variable. They have backgrounds. They're complicated. They're real world images. But you know, they were photographs taken by people in a particular way with a, you know, with a particular <laughs> goal. And most of the photographs you take, you throw out. They don't end up in ImageNet. Right? ImageNet is a weird little idiosyncratic subset of the kind of visual experience that we have. So would this really generalize? So it so happens that um, Boris Katz and Andre Barbu across the street in Seasale have been doing some very interesting studies. This stuff isn't published yet, but I got their permission to tell you about this cool stuff they're doing. And they're saying, hey, let's test AlexNet and other similar uh, deep nets since then on a more realistic, harder version of object recognition that's more characteristic of what humans do. And so they're generating this huge data set of stimuli that they uh, crowdsource. And so people, workers on Mechanical Turk go on there and create images for them. And so they get instructions like, you know, hold an hold a, um, object in this particular location or at this angle or move it here and like send us the images. So they are getting, uh, I think, hundreds of thousands of images um, to test this on. And they're much more variable in the location of the object in the image and its orientation and so forth. So for example, you guys have no problem telling what that thing is, but it's a slightly atypical example. Likewise, what's the object on the floor there? You can tell what it is, but it's a slightly atypical example. And so what Boris and Andre are finding, finding is that human performance is still pretty good on these images. But the deep nets are terrible at this stuff. OK, so ResNet, one of the more recent ones, um, drops from 71% correct on ImageNet to around 25% correct on these images. Uh, and the other um, similar fancy, more recent networks do similarly badly. So on the one hand, AI, the deep nets, are, are awesome and transformative, no question about it. But on the other hand, despite all the hype, they're still not quite like human object recognition, right? They're a whole lot closer than they used to be, but they're not really there. Okay? And more generally, uh, what about harder problems like image understanding, not just labeling and classification, but understanding what's going on in an image. Okay, so you guys have probably seen image captioning bots. Um, there are lots of these around now. This kind of hit the scene in um, 2016 when Google AI came out with a captioning algorithm. And of course, right around the same time, Microsoft had a captioning algorithm. And let's see how they do. So this is an example. You give this uh, algorithm this picture here, and it says, um, that's a dinosaur on top of a surfboard. That's pretty damn good, right? Like, OK, wow. Um, let's look more generally how well this thing works at other examples. OK, it looks at this, and it says, that's a group of people on a field playing football. It's like, wow, OK. A snow-covered field, pretty good. Liu Xuan and uh, Ding Ning posing for a picture. I don't know, but these things are very good at face recognition. That's probably exactly those two people, right? A car parked in a parking or car, yeah, car parked in a parking lot, pretty good. A large ship in the water, pretty good. A clock tower lit up at night, awesome, right? A vintage photo of a pond. Well, the vintage part, I don't know where the pond is. There's a little water in there. I don't know, not way off. A group of people that are standing in the grass near a bridge. Not really. There's grass. There's a bridge, sort of. There's people, but not really, right? 
a group of people standing on top of a boat? Definitely not. A building with a cake? What? A person holding a cell phone? Not. A group of stuffed animals? I love this one. A necklace made of bananas? Wow, we've really landed on Mars here. A sign sitting on the grass. Talk about missing the boat. Now look at this picture for a second. Just figure out what's going on here. Takes a couple seconds. Everyone got it? There's a lot going on here. OK, so this algorithm says, I think it's a group of people standing next to a man in a suit and tie. And the algorithm is correct. But the algorithm has profoundly missed the boat. Okay. So I'm channeling, actually, I stole these slides from Josh Tenenbaum, but let me channel him for a moment and say what his big idea is, which I think is really important. And that is that both humans and deep nets are very good at pattern recognition, pattern classification. This is a cat or a dog or a car or a toaster, right? What they're not good at, what humans are good at, but the deep nets are not, is building models to understand the world. And so when you look at this picture, there are all kinds of things that are crucial for really understanding at a deep level what's going on in here. We need to know why some people, what some people here know, but the guy on the scale does not know. Namely, even if you don't recognize that, that James, that's, that's James Comey, I think it is, here's Obama with his foot on the scale. You need to know that people find it embarrassing if they weigh too much. You need to know that he can't see that Obama's doing it. You need to know that they can see it, even though he can't, and that's kind of the essence of humor. There's just a whole universe of rich structural information going in here that is part of what it means to understand this picture. And no deep net is even close to doing that kind of thing. Okay. So um, bottom line of all this is, or let me just go on more, more generally, AI systems can't navigate new situations, infer what others believe, use language to communicate, write poetry and music to express how they feel, or create math to build bridges, devices, uh, and life-saving medicines. That's a quote from our leader, Jim DiCarlo, head of this department, published in Wired a year ago in a beautiful article on the limitations of deep nets. But more generally, the point is that, yes, AI is taking a massive leap now when we're right in the middle of it, and it's super exciting, and it's helpful to neuroscience and cognitive science. But AI has a lot to learn from us, too, right? A lot to learn from what's going on in here and how this thing works that those AI systems still can't touch. OK, so all of that was my third reason for studying. We're still in the why are we studying the human brain? The fourth reason to study the human brain is the one most compelling to me. And that is that it is just simply the greatest intellectual quest of all time. We could fight about cosmology. I'm not going to fight with you about anything else. I don't think there's any contest. It's the greatest intellectual quest of all time. And that's why I'm in it. And that's why I hope it will be fun for you.